All right, thank you, Dr. Navadi. Um, so at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to Kristen Hampson, uh, who's gonna introduce our first speaker. Awesome, thank you, Kevin. Good morning, my name is Kristen Hampson, and I'm the Neurology Account Manager with Greenwich Biosciences, uh, representing Epidiolex, which is the first and only FDA-approved cannabidiol approved for patients one year and older for seizures associated with TSC, LGS, and Dervais syndrome. Today, our first speaker will be Tony Parks, who will be discussing tips for obtaining employment during a pandemic. Tony serves as assessment coordinator for WorkSource in Spokane, Washington. He has over 15 years experience screening resumes, interviewing, hiring, and training. He holds a bachelor's in communications and is currently pursuing his master's in clinical mental health. He's the father of two and specializes in workshops and assessments to help people rejoin the workforce or to make a career change. So please welcome Tony Parks. Uh, thank you very much, Kristen, for the, uh, the introduction. I'm gonna go ahead and get my, uh, my screen shared here for this presentation. Um, so that's me, I'll be talking about um, obtaining work during a pandemic and something that I'm guessing if you're here, you are interested in learning more about because it is kind of affecting everybody. Um, I, I don't think it's any secret that, that layoffs are kind of at an all time high and the job search in general during a time like this is a little different than it usually is. So my goal is to hit on some of those differences today, um, but I do want to kind of give you a little bit more of, about me so you know who you're talking to. Um, and, and like Kristen said, I spent 15 years in corporate America before coming to WorkSource. Um, and during that time, um, I started out very much loving that job and very much loving the process that went into finding the right fit for a job, making a hire that really affected the company in a positive way. But what happened over time is I, I got wore out. If, if anybody spent much time in corporate America, I'm, I'm guessing maybe you can relate. Um, the way I like to put it, it sort of sucked the soul out of me. And I realized I had to do something different. And I wasn't sure what that change looked like. I just knew that something had to change. Um, and through that process, I, and, and I'm gonna get to that process later on, I'll, I'll share with you kind of how I ended up here at WorkSource, but I, I realized that I really get a lot more out of working on this side of the desk. That's how I refer to it anyway, this side of the desk rather than the other side. Um, rather than help working for a company that's so focused on, on helping people spend their disposable income, now I get to work on a side of the desk where I get to help people figure out what their next income is going to be. Um, and it's just a, a much more rewarding place to be. And, and I look forward to sharing with you how, how I ended up here, here later on when we get into networking. But um, first, let's look at our agenda, where we're going to go today, where, how we're going to spend the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, one of the things that I want to spend some time talking about is applicant tracking systems. And if you're not familiar with applicant tracking systems, they're becoming more and more common. They, they were becoming more and more common before COVID. But since then, more companies are going to them because if they have an opening, there's so many more people now competing for that position because of the, the mass layoffs that have occurred. And there's no way for them to weed through all of those applications and resumes. So they're using this software to determine matches and weed out um, a, a bulk of their load. And now we're going to talk about kind of ways to get tips and tricks for getting around those applicant tracking systems so that you can actually get your resume and interview seen by a human set of eyes. And when you get seen by a human set of eyes, it's going to be important to jump out at them. Part of the way we do that is by targeting your resume. Um, and application. And by the way, today I'll use resume and application interchangeably. Um, when we do these workshops in, for the state of Washington, we have a three hour long workshop for each one. Um, obviously we don't have time for that today, but uh, if you like what you hear today, I do encourage you to uh, go to worksourcewa.com and register for these longer workshops. Um, and they'll go into a lot more detail, but I wanna hit on the stuff that is, that is affected most by the pandemic. And this is the stuff that's gonna help you get through a very competitive job market right now. Targeting your application resume, we'll learn more about what that means as we go. And then interviewing. And that's changed, believe it or not. I'm hoping you can imagine. Um, these days with uh, the, the way that's being done, 
it's not exactly in person with the handshake and the sit down and all of that. A lot of it's either over the phone or virtually just like we're meeting here. Um, and we're gonna talk about some tips and tricks for those kinds of interviews because most people just aren't familiar with doing it that way. And then last, lastly, we'll get to my favorite topic, which is networking. I like to save the best for last. So networking will kind of be um, our dessert. So let's start by talking about quality. When we talk about quality in applications and resumes, we're talking about two things, both the look and the content of it, all right? What you're communicating about yourself, what impression are you making? Are, are you painting a clear picture of yourself in that position, doing in, in that role, doing that job? And that's what you should be thinking about as, you, as you're creating a resume and a job description is, am I putting out a high quality product? Because your application resume are basically, they're screening devices. It's what they are. Now, that, that screener, whoever's looking at it, is looking for a reason to discard yours. Because the more of these they can say, nope, 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 the more times they can say that, the less work they have to do. So your, your, your mission is to not give them a reason. Don't give them a reason to discard yours. And especially don't give them a simple reason, like spelling. And this is what I'm passionate about because spelling and grammar will get you eliminated quickly. And these days with all the tools available, like Grammarly.com for one, there's no reason to be turning in anything less than a perfect product. And you've got, in the state of Washington, you've got great resources through WorkSource. Every county has, just about every county has a WorkSource office. You can get with a career coach. And yeah, we aren't doing in-person meetings because of the pandemic, but they will talk to you over the phone, communicate with you via email. You can send them your resume. And, and have professionals actually look at it for free, by the way, and, and give you some pointers and help out with that. So there's no reason to not be turning in a perfect product. Don't let spelling be your hang up. Um, and because of the massive load, like I said, of applicants, applicant tracking systems are more and more common. The best way around the, this software is to target your resume or your application. And when I say targeting, what, what that means is basically speak their language. And, and you, you have a cheat sheet available for you to create a resume then target it toward a particular job. And yes, you are gonna have a different resume for every single job you apply to. You're gonna make small little tweaks in every, little, every resume you turn in to target it toward that specific job description. Because the job description is your cheat sheet. They're telling you exactly what it is they're after. And what you have to do is identify what they're after and figure out how do, can I speak to, based on my experience, how can I speak to the qualifications they're looking for? And use their language back to them. This is where keywords come in and this is where the applicant tracking system comes in. Because they're gonna take your resume a lot of times with these applicant tracking systems. By the way, 82% of employers out there are using these applicant tracking systems. And if you go to the Fortune 500 companies, over 90% of them are using applicant tracking because they get too many. There's just too many to weed through, so they use the software to at least give them a starting point. And what that software is looking for, it's gonna take their job description, it's gonna take your resume or application and come up with a percentage of match. And if you don't match to a certain percentage, you don't even move on. A human didn't even get a chance to see what you had to offer. So by using their keywords, you're going to help get past that applicant tracking system because part of the software, part of the algorithm is figuring out what the employer is looking for, what keywords are important to them. And there's an old fashioned, I, I try not to say old fashioned, I prefer tried and true method to doing this. <laughs> okay. And that is simply printing out the job description, highlighting what you think is important in it to the employer. What is it they're looking for? In this example, that it was a computer technician that, that they were looking for. So they're looking for that experience, looking for customer service. In this on the screen, they, they highlighted server experience. No, no, they're not looking for a server at a diner here, obviously, right? They're looking for computer server experience. So you wanna to speak to that. Things like data recovery, things like virus removal, disassemble and reassemble, diagnose and repair, um, home and business those kinds of things, and they highlighted those, and then you're gonna take those things you highlighted and speak to them in your resume or the application, whichever one you're, you're working on at that time. Because if you use that language back to them when that, when that software starts screening you out, it's gonna find all these matches, 
and it's going to move you to, on to, to a human set of eyes. And that's the goal at this point in the process. So here is a statement that someone might make on their, on their resume, something they have experienced doing, a qualification. They coordinated with other staff and outside agencies in developing individualized treatment plans. That is great. That is a great statement to make. But then that same person noticed that in the job description, one of the things they were looking for is experience working in collaboration with team members and professionals in development of treatment plans. That's perfect, right? That's exactly what you just said, and that's exactly what they're looking for. But here's the thing, you didn't quite use their language when you did it. So let's look at an edited, a targeted version of the same statement. Co collaborates with team members and professionals in development of individualized treatment plans. So what happened? Okay, we took the word coordinate that we used before, we noticed that they used the word collaborate instead. They mean basically the same thing. So we might as well speak their language back to them because that applicant tracking system is trained to pick up collaborate. It's not trained to pick up coordinate. So you missed a potential match. So you're just gonna speak their language back to them. You mentioned with other staff. Well, this company uses the terminology team members. So you might as well speak their language, change other staff to team members, and then the rest pretty much uh, spoke for itself, developing. Use, they'd be throwing professionals instead of outside agencies to speak their language, and then in the individualized treatment plans. But that is a targeted statement. That's what we mean when we talk about targeting a resume or an application. So let's look at one more example, just in case. Um, oh, sorry, I, I don't have the example. What I do have is, is take crowd, but, but I'm going to go back to this real quick. Because this, this is all things that you already said. All you're doing is saying a different way, speak their language. Now, even if it's not an applicant tracking system, even if it's a human set of eyes that's looking at this, that, that human set of eyes has the job posting in front of them and they're, they're comparing it to all of these resumes they're getting. And this is just going to speak more directly even to a human, um, just like it would speak more directly to the applicant tracking system. All right. Now we have a great online tool that's available to help us identify keywords in an online job description. It's called tagcrowd.com. And if you've never used tagcrowd.com, I think you're gonna like how this works. It's, it's, it creates word clouds. And, and yet, I always like to throw in, there's an app for that because there's an app for everything these days. And tagcrowd is a great app for identifying keywords. What I'm gonna do, I hope this works seamlessly. I'm going to jump to, there we go. So I'm going to jump to, you should be seeing my internet screen there. And what I have up is worksourcewa.com. Just search for, the, search for the job project manager. This is one of the jobs that came up. So what I did is I went and just copied the entire job description, everything they were looking for. Highlighted it all, right click, copied it. Go into tag crowd, which looks like so. Let me see if I can reset this well maybe not but anyway i've copied and pasted it right into this little window that they have open here and then click visualize and when you do that the bigger words are going to be the ones that showed up the most the smaller words showed up the least it even gives you a word count like i know project came up 30 times required came up 27 times now required isn't a word that you're probably going to work into your resume but things like, let's see, essential, they use that word. Now maybe you were talking about something you, you, you did or a project you worked on um, or, or skills that you had that, that you valued as important. You might change your phrasing from important to essential. Um, maybe one of the things that, that, that you said you did a lot was that um, you made sure certain things were done to a certain level. Well, you might ch ch change that to ensure. And we're just talking about speaking their language. Maybe you created a new process. We could change create to develop because you see that's a word that they used a lot. So hopefully you're getting the idea of how tag crowd works and how it can, it can really help you target your resume. They mentioned stakeholders quite a few times. And if you had experience working with stakeholders, probably be a good thing to work in. And they used vision. Now I can tell you from, from, from my own experience, one of the things I did getting into uh, to, to where I'm at now, um, I did some research on the company before my interview 
and the, the agency I work for is called Career Path Services. And I noticed that one of the things that they referred to a lot was that they didn't just work hard, they did heart work as well. And they use that word heart a lot. It's even in their logo, in their company logo. Now, some of the things that I put in my, my resume were some of the things that I was passionate about. So what I did is I changed, and, and, and at this time, I didn't even know that targeting was a thing because I hadn't had all the training I do now, but I still changed my passion to things that I had a heart for. I have a heart for coaching kids or whatever it might have been. So I just changed passion to something I have a heart for because I noticed that heart was something that was important to them. All right. By targeting, you're going to get their attention. You're going to get past the applicant tracking system and you're going to get their attention. Now that you have their attention, how do you go about setting yourself apart from everybody else? And that's where quantifying comes in. You're going to show that employer your value, what value you bring to the table through quantifying your accomplishments. Quantifying is really simple because you have your qualifying stuff, but here's the thing, everybody out there, all those other people applying for the job, they've seen this job description. And if they're applying, they're qualified also. So simply stating your qualifications isn't gonna set you apart from everybody else. What you need to do is take those qualifications and quantify them. And when we talk about quantifying, we're talking about now speaking to three things that mean a lot to a company. Money, time, and people, okay? And if you can speak to those things and quantifying the things that qualify you for the job, now you're gonna set yourself apart from the competition. So an original statement before quantified might be, they're looking for somebody with experience preparing a company payroll. You're like, great, I have experience preparing a company payroll. But so does everybody else. So what is special about your experience? Well, I prepared a company payroll for 800 people in 12 locations across the United States. Now you've quantified that. Now you've created a wow factor. And now anybody else who just said they simply prepared company payroll, you've set yourself apart from. Thinking in terms of, again, money, time, and people. Another great example of quantifying. If they want somebody with the experience in inventory management systems, okay, you can say, I once improved an inventory management system. That's great. You are qualified. But to quantify that, well, how did you improve it? What was the result? So I developed a new inventory management system that saved over $50,000 in its first year. Now you're speaking to the pocketbook. Now you're raising their eyebrows. Now they're thinking maybe the position you're looking for pays $50,000 a year. And now they're thinking to themselves, this person will pretty much work for free. They're going to save us what we're going to pay them. Now you're speaking in terms of achievements that you have and problems you've solved. So if you can quantify, if you can first target to get past the screen, quantify, to wow them. Now they might be thinking about having you in for that interview, right? But they might decide first, before we spend our time interviewing them, let's see what other people have to say about them. And this is where they might ask for some references. And yeah, this is a funny little cartoon, but it proves my point. You need to cultivate your job references. You're, you're at least three professional references that you already have prepared so that if you're asked for them, you can provide them. And you need to cultivate those relationships. Keep these people in the loop. Let them know how your job search is going. Don't annoy them. Don't inundate them with a whole bunch of feedback, but keep them in the loop. Well, first of all, ask their permission. I hope everybody knows that. You have to ask permission to use, to use somebody as a reference, okay? But then maintain those relationships. And here's the thing, you might come across some jobs where you're thinking, oh, that job seems all right. I, I think I'll go ahead and apply to that. Maybe I'll get an interview and see what it's all about. But you might come across a job description where you're like, this is the job. This is the one. This is the one I want. This is, this is the job for me. So now this one means a little bit more to you. I might reach out to my job references and say, hey, look, I'm applying for this job. I really want to get it. Um, I'm attached to this email that I'm sending you is, is the job description, the job posting that I'm replying to. And just so that you know what, what to speak to if you're called upon. Now, if I'm somebody's reference and I get this, I'm going to be excited because I'm like, now I have a cheat sheet if I'm called upon because being a reference is sometimes difficult. You don't really know what to speak to, but you just gave them exactly what to speak to. 
So now you're taking your reference, you're educating them a little bit about what you're doing, and you're making their job easier. And they're going to get to speak directly to the job posting when called upon. This is, this, this, is, this is a huge one, you guys, and I hope if, I call them nuggets, those are the takeaways that you might get from today, and, and I hope this is, this is a, a, a decent nugget for all of you to take away if you're out there in the job search. And if you're here, um, I'm guessing you're either looking or maybe you're in a job, maybe looking for the job. That's where a lot of us find ourselves, and that's when I get into networking, something that we'll, uh, we'll talk about some more. But um, so now I've got the references, we might get called in for that interview. Before I talk to you about interviewing, I do want to just go over some quick basic rules. Basic rules for the job search. Rule number one, create a master application. All right, this is our first building block. Master application is a file in your computer has all of your employment information that could possibly be asked on an application that you could possibly be asked for. Now when you're filling out an application, you have that open, you also have your, your master application open, you're simply taking the information from one source and putting it into another. So instead of recreating it every single time, you're just copying it over rather than recreating. It's gonna make you more efficient and more effective because by the way, every time you do it, you might think of a better way to phrase things and make those changes in your master application and slowly your master application turns into a masterpiece. And this is where quantifying comes in again, because as you're talking about your job duties, be specific. That's your next building block. Be specific about your job duties and quantify them where you can. And I'm going to say it again, so it must be important, right? Don't let spelling and grammar be what eliminates you from the competition. All right? Spelling and grammar communicates professionalism and attention to detail, if nothing else. And I can't think, I always hear from people, spelling isn't a big deal in my industry. But here's the thing, you're not in your industry if you're looking for the job, you're trying to get back in, back into your industry. And if you can't, if, you, if you're not self-aware enough to pick up on that, you're communicating a lack of professionalism and a lack of attention to detail. Every job I can think of requires attention to detail. And then the last building block, the professional email address. You guys, if you're, if you're still using the email address you had in high school, it might be time to rethink it and ask yourself, what is my email handle? What is my email address communicating about me? I had someone come to my desk one time, so distraught because they weren't getting the, the, the interviews they thought they should be getting. And one, one example I'll give you, busy mom four was her email handle. And, and here's the thing, I get it. If you're a busy mom of four, you should take some pride in that. But is that the very first thing you wanna be communicating to a prospective employer? that you're busy, in their eyes, maybe possibly distracted, maybe possibly gonna be calling in because, um, because you've got sick kids, you gotta get kids to, to point A, B, and C. It's real, okay? And, and that's something that you should be proud of, but, but could it possibly eliminate you? I'm not saying it's right or wrong, I'm just saying it's real. Okay, another one that came across my desk one time, Larry the Man 420. I kid you not, Larry the Man 420. So Larry the Man, here's the thing, confidence is good, arrogance is bad, <laughs> all right? And Larry the Man is just communicating arrogance. And 420, if you aren't aware, 420 means you're marijuana friendly. And I get that some states now are marijuana friendly. Washington, of course, we are. But is that the first thing you want to communicate to a prospective employer? I hope not. Maybe Unless you're going for a job, maybe at a pot shop. I don't know, but I wouldn't do it. My email address once upon a time, Tony Parks was taken. So I use Tony Parks 1978. What am I communicating? My exact age. And you guys, ageism, right or wrong, it's real. And do you wanna be giving that information away? So that's some things to think about. Some basic rules for the job search. All right, in interviewing, this game has definitely changed. All right, and we're gonna get in some tips for telephone interviews and some tips for virtual interviews. And then I'll just go over some questions that you should be prepared for in any interview, whether it's in person or not. But when you're talking about telephone interviews, okay? First of all, telephone interviews kind of like an open book test, okay? They can't see you. So you can have all of your notes and references and the job description and all these things in front of you. And, and, and you can have them referred to. Now organize them so they're not hearing a bunch of papers shuffling around and all that kind of nonsense, but it's like an open book test. It's kind of a good situation to be in. Some, some things to remember, dependable phone number, okay? Dependable, uh, this should say 
connection, ensure a good connection. If you're using a cell phone and you live up in the boonies with a weak signal, be aware of that. Maybe for, at the time of the interview, go somewhere where you have a better connection, but wherever that place is, make sure it's quiet, no distractions, okay? And have your cheat sheet there with you ready, ready to go. The other thing, listen, don't dominate the conversation. All right. Yes, you have a lot of notes about your talking points, but regulate your speech. You want it to come out conversational. Don't rush it. And this one's huge, you guys. Smile. Smile. I know they can't see you, but it comes through in your voice. Okay. So smile. I always tell people stand up as well. Standing up changes the dynamic of your voice a little bit. I would stand up if I could to do this. And I have an elevator desk so I can do that. My problem is my feet and my mouth work in unison and I would be pacing all over the place. And you're probably just looking at the, at the, uh, the screen anyway, not me, but um, I have a hard time staying on camera if I'm standing up. So I have to sit down when I do these things. That's part of my self-awareness, see? All right, virtual interviews. These people get intimidated by and the technology is part of the intimidation. I get it. So you have to familiarize yourself with technology ahead of time. Whatever platform they're using, go to the website, download the platform um, so that you have it on your computer and you're using the app version rather than the website version. It's usually a little uh, better to use that way. Uh, be aware of your location. Okay. Make sure it's quiet, set aside some time. The kids aren't gonna be coming in behind you. Um, yes, I understand I have my wall of fame behind me um, and it can be distracting, but I've got a small house and my office is, uh, is my office. So that's the way, that's the way it works. Um, lighting matters. I've got a light in front of me and a light behind me. Um, if you have just a light behind you, it could come across as a shadow. Just a light in front of you can wash you out. And again, in this environment, you can have your cheat sheet available. Okay, have it down, out of sight, but you can still reference it. Eye contact is a big one, all right? Even though it's virtual, when they're speaking, you can look at them on the screen. When you speak back to them, look into your camera. Look directly into the camera because on their end, it's going to mean eye contact. If you're looking down at your notes or down at your hands or off to the side or whatever you're doing, okay, you wanna, you wanna Take this just like an in-person interview and make that important eye contact and dress appropriately. All right, dress, or they always say dress for the job you want, not the job you have. Dress appropriately for this, okay? Um, and I say dress from the head down. And yes, they're never gonna see you below your waist. They don't even know if you're wearing pants, okay? But I'm still gonna wear the pants that I would normally wear, the socks I would normally wear, the belt, the shoes, all the things, because I think it just changes your mood. So just go the whole distance because it's going to change how you present yourself. And then again, smile, smile, smile. Show your passion and enthusiasm for the job through your body language. And you guys just practice, practice. Get on these platforms, whatever platform you're gonna use, and here's a list of some of them, but the list is endless, there could be so many. Um, and record yourself in that platform ahead of time, just answering a basic interview question. And if you're not sure of basic interview questions, I'm gonna share a few with you. I'm gonna throw some at you rapid fire and you'll see which ones you've heard before and which ones might stick as something you need to practice. All right, so practice these platforms ahead of time. Um, that's, that one's gonna be huge. Luckily for me, this was done on Zoom and I've, with Zoom and WebEx are the two I'm the most familiar with. Um, so I got lucky today. <laughs> All right, in-person interviews. If this part makes you nervous, if this part makes you nervous, the first thing I'm going to do, say is before you go into the interview, visualize success. What does a successful interview look like to you? If you walked out of it and thought, yes, I nailed it, what does that look like? And visualize it. And that should help with your jitters just a little bit. It's going to put you in that mindset for success. And then some things to prepare for, some questions to prepare for. I'm just going to rattle these off just to just so you guys, and what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take this slide deck and, and send it um, to the foundation. And, and, and then if somebody would like, they can send it out to, to all of you so that you have some of these um, that you can refer to. But things to prepare for. Why'd you leave your last job? You should have a prepared response for that. Tell me about yourself. What are your short and long range goals? And what has been your most significant career accomplishment? But no worry, I'm not done. 
What are your strengths and weaknesses? This one usually comes across as give me three strengths and one weakness. Be honest about your weakness, by the way, but also tell them that you've identified it and the things you're doing to improve on it. How would your coworkers describe you? Why are you the best candidate for the job? What are your salary expectations? Talking about money is always a tough one, but be prepared for that. What personalities are challenging for you to work with? Why do you wanna work for this company? These are all things you should have prepared responses for. And some of these stumped you. We don't have time today to go into how to answer every single tough question in interview, but there is a great interviewing workshop available through WorksforceSquad.com. It's a, I think interviewing is offered like twice a week and you can register for those classes totally free. All right. All right, I got a quick networking spiel for you guys and then we're gonna open it up for some questions. But here's the thing, 80%, why do I throw 80% up there? 80% is the number that represents the hidden job market. Believe it or not, 80% of the jobs that are filled never see a, a, an online job board. They never get posted on Indeed. They never get posted on Monster or Workforce Wa. They, they, they never get out there. Why? Because that's not how employers prefer to do their hiring. They prefer to do their hiring from within. They promote from within. Look at the number of candidates they have to deal with. Now, if that doesn't work, then they might go to employee referrals and they've got a little more to deal with. If that doesn't work, they might go to a staffing agency or multiple staffing agencies, maybe put it on their company website. But their last resort is usually an online job board. By the time it gets to there, usually most positions and most quality positions have already been filled. So if you're not putting yourself out there, then you're missing out on a lot of opportunities. And you may not be in there, but here's the thing. You, you, you have to be networking, letting people know about your situation. LinkedIn is a great way to do this. And I'm not gonna get too far into LinkedIn. If you're not on LinkedIn and you're looking for a job, you're doing yourself a disservice. So get on there, Google LinkedIn tutorial. There's all kinds of sources for you to, to build your LinkedIn and make it like an online uh, resume. So I'm gonna skip through all of this because I wanna get into my networking spiel, which I call why not. Why do I call it why not? Because that's my name backwards and I think I'm clever. So, but why not? You gotta ask yourself why not when you have an opportunity to put yourself out there, why not put yourself out there? Say yes to things, let people know your circumstances and always, always, always put your best foot forward in everything you do. So when I first, I, I mentioned that I spent 15 years in corporate America and when I realized I couldn't do that anymore, I was in a spot, didn't know what I was gonna do, um, didn't know what the next step looked like, but I didn't hide that from people either. And my best friend at the time, Nick, a friend of Nick's had come over to my house with me and I was showing off a remodel project I'd done. I'd done it myself, I was very proud of it. And I met his buddy, Seth. And this was probably two years prior to me looking for anything. When it came time and I, and I decided I needed to make a change, I got a call from this guy, Seth, who'd met me with Nick. And Seth said, hey, I'm remodeling my church and, and I know you're handy with that kind of thing. Would you like to come do some work? Can't pay a lot, but I can pay you something. You know what I said? Why not? So there I'm working at this church, doing my best, putting my best foot forward every day. When Mondays came along and everybody else was complaining about being there on a Monday and, and how tired they were, I said, you know what? No, I'm not going to do that. Okay, I kept it positive all the time, was happy to be there. While I was at that church doing my work every day, a guy came in a few days a week and did these CPR classes. Got people certified in CPR. And I got to know him. And he said, oh, you're, you're looking for, for work? Well, it couldn't hurt to have a CPR certification. I said, that's a good point. So I sat through one of his CPR classes and I went into it thinking this is gonna be miserable. I've been through these before and uh, they, they, they put you to sleep. Well, three hours later, I went up to him. I said, I got to tell you, my stomach hurts from laughing so much. That was, that was amazing. I can't believe how entertaining you made that. And we got to talk and he said, and ultimately he said, hey, what would you think about coming in and teaching some of these classes for me? So what did I say? Why not? Got myself instructor certified, went in, started teaching these CPR classes, found out I really enjoyed it. Did that for a long time. One day I'm certifying the Wendy's restaurants in the Spokane area. And in one of those classes, the vice president of Wendy's was there. And she looked familiar, but I couldn't quite place it. Place how I knew her. And after the class, she comes up to me and she said, Tony, right? I said, yeah. And I, I said, where do I know you from? She said, I'm Josh's wife. I said, ah, Josh who? She said, the owner of Bottles. 
So, oh, Bottles is my favorite pub in town. Okay, the little beer and wine shop, they're great. If you're in the Spokane area, um, Bottles is a great spot on Argonne. Anyway, she said, Josh and I have been closed on Tuesdays because it's so slow, but we've thought about opening and having trivia night. Would you be interested in hosting trivia night? So what did I say? Why not? So now I've got three jobs. None of them is the job, they're all a job, but I'm putting myself out there. Now I did trivia about a year into trivia. I got to know all the locals. We're done with trivia one night. I'm walking around saying hi to the people that I know and some friends had brought some friends and we started talking about what I do and that I was going to school to be a counselor. And she said, one of the friend of a friend said, you know what? I think you'd, you'd really like what I do. Here's my card. You should come in and, and check out our office sometime. So I said, why not? So I show up, she introduces me around, shows me what they do, and I'm walking around. And, and the more I was there, the more I thought, wow, this is, this is a great group of people. I love what they do. I had no idea that WorkSource Spokane even existed. About two days later, a job came up with Career Path Services. I read the description. I thought, this sounds, this sounds like me. And I, put, I went all in on this resume, this application, my references. I had them all prepped. And I was like, this is the one for me. This is what I want to do. And you guys, two months later, I got the job. And every day when I get to do these workshops and I get to, I get to connect with somebody and help them connect dots and find that next, that, that next nugget that's going to help them get their next source of employment, I have no doubt that I'm right where I'm supposed to be doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. You just never know. You have to put your best foot forward in every single thing that you do. Because here's the thing, in those years that I spent doing all those part-time jobs, I was putting my resume out there. I was searching Indeed. I was doing all those things. And ultimately, all those interviews that I had that I got, that got my heart into, ultimately, I, I would rather be doing what I'm doing than any of those. And it didn't even come from, from my job search. It just came from putting myself out there and saying yes to things. So put your best foot out there and see what happens. That's what I have for you guys today. Um, I hope that you take away some, some nuggets that help your job search, help you find that next source of, uh, of employment. Thank you. Tony, that was great. This is Chris. Uh, we have a number of great questions as well from your address there. So I would like to get started here right from the top. Perfect. The first question, um, this is one that is very common and a, a concern and an inquiry that I'm sure is very familiar to lots. So how, are, do, how do or should I address having epilepsy when in the interviewing process? Great question. And, and, and here's the thing, unless you're specifically asked, it's not the type of thing that you're necessarily required to share. In, in the interview process, the way it might be posed in the interview is um, asking if you have any accommodations that, that you might need met. Um, and that's how you would address it. And then you just got to be honest. That, that's all. Just tell them that, that that's where you're at. And you, so, so here's another thing, another resource for you to reach out to is a Department of Labor and Industries. All of the work sources, to my knowledge, in, this, in the Washington, in Washington State, have an, an LNI employee on staff just to help with this, and I, I'm pretty certain that they're not allowed to ask until after the job offer has been made. But if it does come up, I'm not 100% on that, and I should be. But if it does come up, you just got to be honest and let them know, and and put as positive a spin on anything that you share like that as you possibly can. Was that answer helpful? Absolutely love but you, it. Real quick, I do want to reiterate, you're not required to just come out with it. Um, and, and that's what I find in, in helping people through interviews a lot, is that sometimes they share too much information that they didn't necessarily have to. But if you're asked, of course, be honest. And somebody Thank mentioned that they're definitely not allowed to ask. So there you go. Our second question here, what would you directly recommend as having as a header on an application? You know, for example, name, email, phone number, what would you recommend? Great question, and you, you, you nailed it. Name, email, phone number. You do not have to put address. You don't even have to put city and state. And here's the thing. These days, again, you're sharing information that you could possibly be judged on. And if you don't think that recruiters and, and hiring managers are out there trying to gain as much information as you can, as they can about you before the interview, then you're crazy. 
they're going to be trying to see, see what your Facebook looks like and all these other things. They can even go on Google Earth, if you give them your address, and see how well you maintain your lawn. So you don't have, and, and just like in Spokane, there's, I don't know how many different neighborhoods here, and depending on which neighborhood you're in, there might be a certain uh, connotation to that. So don't share that information that could possibly be used against you. Love it. And that's all the more reason to mow your lawn, I guess. <laughs> Thank you for that, Tony. Exactly. Moving forward, at the end of an interview, when asked if I have any questions, what are some examples of quality questions you can ask? I'm, honestly, ah. that's a very common thing at the end of an interview. Would you give any examples or common questions in general? One of my favorites that I was asked in an interview, and I was on a panel, and the interviewee asked each of us to answer, um, what is your favorite part about working here? Um, and that, especially in a panel interview, because we each got, and we all worked together, so we all knew each other, and, and the, the conversation that it created um, just changed the whole dynamic of that interview. Uh, so I think doing that, um, asking them what they like about, about working there is, is a, a huge one. And you get a feel for it too. And you should ask questions that you really want to know the answer to. Thank you again, Tony. Moving forward, another is a kind of an opinion from your end. How useful is LinkedIn? <laughs> um, I can give you the statistics, I guess, and, and recruiters who are out there, 90% of them use it as, as a, a, a number one resource. Um, so d depending on your industry, and you're going to have to be an expert in your own industry, it can be very, very useful. And I found out after the fact that mine was checked out by, by Career Path Services before hiring me. Um, and mine wasn't nearly as kept up as it is now. It still could be improved. Um, but if you're, if you're out there looking for employment, don't have a job, you have time, take your LinkedIn and make it your resume. Because yeah, a lot of recruiters use it to find people. Excellent. Thank you for that as well. The next is a little bit of an opinion as well from you. If you wouldn't mind sharing, what would you recommend over going to job agencies to recruiters in general? How would you go about that? And what are the, some of the benefits and consequences, if any? If I'm understanding the question right, then what's being asked is, is there a benefit to going directly to a company um, and asking if they're hiring? Is that what I'm... In this case, I think it was meant in the sense of to embolden a job search in general is, you know, how useful are job agencies, recruiting agencies in, oh. in emboldening your out in your search for another job? In my personal opinion, um, not all that useful. Um, for, for an employer side and from an employer standpoint, ha having a hired recruiter to help you find people is great from a, from a job seeker side. Um, not nearly as useful as a lot of other things you could spend your time investing in. That's great as well. The last question we had is, you know, at what level should research be done on a company before you go and speak to them or research on your own organization, whatever it may be you have in your history that could come up in a question? How deep would you recommend going in that research before you get into conversations and interviews? Um, you're going to have to just, I mean, that's going to be how excited are you about the job and your time is valuable. I mean, let's be honest, our, our, everybody's time is valuable. Um, so you're, you're going to have to decide that for yourself. The more excited you are about it, the deeper I'd say to dive. Um, I asked specifically that person who gave me the tour when I get, when I got called for an interview, I got a hold of that person again and I said, Hey, look, I'm getting an interview. What should I know ahead of time? And this is where communication <laughs> breakdowns can be important because one of the things she told me was do some research on CPS and their history and because that'll probably come up and I thought to myself wow what is what does uh, child protective services have to do with this job well and she said CP but I did it I did my research but what she was referring to was career path services <laughs> and so I researched the wrong thing and now I know a lot more than I ever want to know about um, child protective services but the, the lesson is you're going to dive as deep as the position is important to you. Know as much as you can, as much about their language, their mission, their values, um, their, their vision, research all that. And it's easy to find, right? Just the about us section on their website. But know those things going into it and see how much of that you can incorporate into your responses to them. Excellent. 